Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks also a lot for, for the invitation. I'm very happy to have the chance uh, to attend this seminar today. Thanks a lot everyone for, for attending. So I'm going to present one of the of the research tracks uh, that, that you have at INSAPE and that's mainly carried on by, by our team uh, in, in Boston and Paris, but also by other teams in the company, which is about like these foundation models for, for genomics. As you mentioned, we developed this uh, nucleotide transformer models that obviously I, I talk about. I think we started to develop this more like a bit more than one year and a half, maybe two years ago. And we released them like kind of one, one year ago. So let's talk about that and then show what we've done after that, what we think are the, the next uh, exciting directions to, to improve these models. And I show a few, a few recent contributions uh, that the, the teams have made. I think there, there will be some like yeah, I announced for the first time some of them uh, during this seminar. So looking forward to it. So can okay, I just to end, yes, please anyone feel free to, to interrupt me uh, for questions that at any time, let's make it uh, interactive, it would be nicer. So can have the, one, one of the motivation, let's say for, for AI researchers um, to look at, at genomics or, or biology in general can can be summarized into these three, three topics on this set. So the first one is not necessarily related to bio, but I would say to, to AI or computer science in general which is this small rows that show that kind of the, the cost of compute is uh, decreasing every year. Actually, the efficiency of compute is doubling every year. Actually, it's even a bit more than that uh, in practice, especially with uh, recent chips developed by NVIDIA. Something interesting is that in addition to this small rows, there's kind of an, an equivalent row for algorithms. So not only compute is becoming cheaper and more efficient, but also algorithms are becoming much more efficient. And that's why we can kind of experience an exponential uh, improvement of, of these algorithms in AI. Combined to that, the, the cost of data is, is decreasing a lot. So as you know, we, we need a lot of data to train this system. And so the good news is that, for instance, if we look at the cost of the full genome, full human genome sequencing, it's kind of experiencing the same, same types of exponential rows. And we are kind of seeing right now not far from one hundred dollars to like sequence one one genome. So if you take one letter for for a token, like if you make a, a parallel with the Jaguar models, it's three it's one hundred dollars uh, for three billion tokens, which is really not expensive, and this is probably going to decrease over years. And finally, maybe the the most exciting thing for us is, is the complexity. Like biology is extremely complex. Genomics is extremely complex. There is lots of different processes, lots of different data types, modalities. And so it's a very nice playground uh, for AI models. I would say it's probably you now the, the, big, the next biggest challenge uh, for AI system. And if you look at what's happening in, in AI conferences at NeurIPS, ICERA, ICML, you can see more and more contributions in this domain. And we, we think that it's only going to increase uh, through years. So that was kind of for our initial motivation uh, to be this this mode for genomics that obviously also aligns uh, with with the company directions and, and our acquisition with BioNTech where we know using like, this model so for lots of applications internally and yeah, for our motivation was similar to what has done in, in NAP to train systems like ChatGPT where people are going to take all the all the data they can find if even if it's not label data so to be the actual gpt system you take of all the data you find on wikipedia and use this technique called self-supervised learning so with self-supervised learning you can train a neural network without needing any label by just setting any task that's relevant to the data so in the case of chat gpt you just take sentences you find on the web and just predict the words from from left to right and that's what we're trying to do. But instead of taking sentences, we're going to take genomes. And we're going to like scrape all the genomes we, we can find on the web from, hum from human individuals, but also from lots of different species. We're going to like cut these genomes into pieces and train a neural network to reconstruct the data. So we could also use we have to write prediction and it's been done in some recent works. In our case, we decided to, to use another technique, which is called, ma which is called mask language bordering. So we're going to randomly like mask some parts of the input DNA sequences and, and reconstruct them. And we do that at very large scale. So we train models up to billions of parameters. We do that on like 
hundreds of, of genomes, which correspond to like a trillion of, of tokens if we want to make a parallel with, with an IP. And we've done that on various different hardwares. Uh, I'm showing you like the, the different models that, that we've trained so far. So we started from uh, the human reference genomes only, and then started to increase uh, the amount of data we put in the data set, as well as the amount of parameters uh, in the model. We trained this very big, like 2.5 billion parameters more on, on this multi-species data set with 850 species uh, on Cambridge One with NVIDIA. We also trained uh, a model on Google Cloud for edible plants. So same idea, but with a, a focus on, on plant genomes and on, on plants task. I'm also happy to announce that this paper has just been accepted actually at uh, Communications Biology two days ago. So if you're interested, there is the reference on, on the side if you want to check it out. And, and it's called the Agro uh, Nucleotide Transformer. And we also trained uh, the V2 of, of this models, and I, I give a few words in the coming slides, also on Google Cloud and like smaller models, but trained on, on much more data. And something that I would say was the first very good surprise that we had and that we observed with all these different models that we trained is that if you play this game of mass language modeling on, on a lot of data and, and you do that at scale, what you observe is that after the training, despite no supervision, the models are going to capture uh, genomics knowledge, going to capture uh, genomics features, whereas it's never been told what these features are during training. And also something that was pretty interesting for us is that if you look at the different layers of, of the model we use, which is a transformer, you can see that different layers are capturing uh, different granularity of the input data. So on that example, and yeah, the example I show um, have been computed like on, on hundreds of thousands of, of sequences, you can see that in the first layer, you can make the difference between uh, coding and non-coding regions, whereas when you move uh, in the model towards the end, you're going to capture more and more elements and maybe capture very fine grain information at the end of the of the network. We so on previous slides I looked at embeddings for transformers. You can also look at attention maps and observe the same kind of trends. Like we showed that most of uh oh yeah, all the models actually captures um several like genomics features can see on this example like enhancers or exons, and I show four different models. What's also was very interesting for us is that if you move to very big models, which are the one on the on the bottom right of, of these graphs, you can see that they become very specialized. So only one one head in one layer is going to recognize these specific elements, but it's going to pay almost all, all its attention uh, to that specific element. So despite like any any supervision during training, see that ads are going to recognize and answers or exons and, and replay this game with lots of other elements and, and observe the same kind of behaviors. And that would say it's kind of the, the motivation for, for the main use of, of these models, which is like uh, fine tuning. So given the fact that they can capture during their pre-training genomics data, genomics features, like most probably they're going to be very good features extractors and we can use these models to build new models, like new classification models or regression models that are going to be like very easy to build given the features that have been extracted by this model. And so that's what we repaired a lot um, in, in our paper and in coming papers. And you see most of the, of the recent developments are, are being obtained with this technique. And so, so a technique that's been used in lots of other works of this literature, or also in proteomics, or even it's been used previously in English as well, where you're going to have this first phase of self-supervised pre-training, which is very expensive and long. So you retrieve hundreds of, of genomes from different species. You condemn it to chunks. You use self-supervised learning. So in our case, you're going to mask uh, some nucleotides in this sequence and reconstruct these nucleotides, specifically in this work, we use the K-MERS with K equals six. So we mask like six MERS in the sequence and reconstruct them. And after that, you can, you can fine tune the network. So one we fine tune is that you take the same network with the weights that you obtained during this pre-training, you're going to change the final layer. And if you want to do classification, you're going to use a layer maybe with two neurons. If you want to do binary classification, if you want to do regression, you're going just to add a single neuron to output the scale you want, and you're going to fine tune this network on this task. 
So we've played this game on quite a, a good number of tasks. So in, in our paper, we curated like 18 downstream tasks where our goal was to span different biological processes, was to span also different uh, species paper and refine to our network on all these tasks. What's I would say very interesting is that you only while the pre-training phase is very expensive, the fine tuning is very fast. So we talk about just a few minutes on a single GPU. And in most of these tasks, without having to change any parameters, just taking the model of the chef and fine tuning in a few minutes on the task, you're going to reach very good performance. You're going most of the time to match or outperform uh, specialized baselines. And we also compared our model to like other foundation models of, of the literature and show that they, they exhibit very good performance. Notably, and I would say, as it's been observed in, in different fields, the, the main findings here are the size uh, of the model matters, like the, the bigger model we have, like the 2.5 billion parameters is the is the best one on, on this task. And also the diversity of data matters. So typically the model that has been the, the more diversity with these 850 genomes is showing the, the best performance. And on the right, uh, bottom right of the side, I'm also showing independent study, like this band, uh, benchmark that's being presented, I think, right now at ICRR, uh, that also show uh, similar reasons on, on different tasks. We then developed this, this new collection of models called Nucleotide Transformer V2 that have been released in the new version of the paper. I think we released this more maybe now six months ago where the main idea was to see to what extent we can we can compress uh, the information in the model. So as as I mentioned uh, in the first slide, there is this model for, for compute, but there is also this model for algorithms efficiency. And so if you look at how the transformer architecture uh, evolved and what what types of tricks people are using to train it, uh, you, you can you can with the same amount of compute do, do much better. So it's what we've done here. We, double the context length of our architecture. We also use uh, some different act activations. We change also the positional embedding and we train for much longer um, using the Chinchilla scaling rows from DeepMind. And what we show is that by doing that, you can actually outperform the 2.5 billion parameters model with the 500 million uh, models, which is much faster to, to train, also much faster to use for inference so typically as it's five less parameters, it's like almost between five and 10 times uh, faster than, than the previous model. We also looked at other tasks than the 18 tasks I, I presented. And so I, I come with other expressing results later in the presentation, but we already wanted kind of as a, as a first validation step of this model to see or we can solve tasks that are harder than simple classification or, or regression given a sequence. And so we use these um, V2 models that can take up to 12 kbp as input to, to do the spacing task from Stress AI. So we just find you the, the model and the exact same data uh, that's been used in the Stress AI paper. And we show that same after. So this training is a bit longer because there's more data, but I can only one or two hours in the GPU, we can get a, a very decent spacing model and actually match and, and even not perform on some metrics the, the space AI uh, model. So that kind of concludes this, this nucleotide transform model as, and as Laura mentioned, and I also go back to that in, in the end of the presentation, they are, they are available on Hugging Face and, and on GitHub if you want to check them out. And we also read the like, uh, example notebooks on how to use them. And now I would like to to take the rest of this presentation to chat about the like, yeah what are avenues uh, to to further improve these models because as we showed they can be used to solve let's say a simple task that can be used as good starting point um, for ML research but I would say we are not there yet if we actually really want to to generate big breakthroughs in in the field and so one one big question we ask ourselves in in the team. And the company in general is that, what are the next steps? What should we do now to make this more tree really useful to really obtain a uh, breakthrough in, in genomics? And so here, there are probably other directions, but here we see like four directions that that's important for us. And the first one is actually the only one I, I'm not going to touch uh, in this presentation, but I wanted to, to quickly mention it, which is context length. 
So um, in the models that I've presented so far, we can go only up to uh, 12,000 uh, nucleotides, which is to what on one side I would say already wrote compared to other models, but which is not enough. If you want to, to capture language dependency in DNA, for instance, if you would like to use this model to do gene expression prediction, you're probably completely going to miss uh, interactions between enhancers and the gene, et cetera. And so increasing the context of this model is, is very important. And this, this is tricky if you want to use the transformer architecture, because in the transformer, you're going to have a quadratic scaling of the compute unit with respect to the sequence length. So if you multiply by 10, the sequence length, you're going to multiply by 100 the compute. So typically, if you would like to go from 12,000 KBPs to 1 million nucleotides, for instance, would be completely intractable. That's also something that we're working on in the team, but I wanted to highlight here a few very cool recent works that are also addressing this question. So there are works addressing that in, in supervised learning, like the Informer or, or Borzoi, but it's been also addressed in self-supervised learning recently. And most of the works actually kind of uh, converge toward like uh, state-based models. And so I wanted to mention, for instance, Caducius, uh, which I think a very recent work from Cornell Tech University on using by the Shonomamba. There is also obviously Aena DNA. I think many people are aware of and very recently from, from the same team, uh, Evo which also use kind of a state space more to deal with very long sequences. And the, the first of, of these directions that I would like to touch on in, and that we're actively working on in the team is the, the multi-modalities side, side of things. And especially one, one question we wanted to answer with the team is how can we connect to these genomics language models or the modalities? Notably, there's been models that have been trained on RNA, there's been more that have been trained on proteins. And the question was, could we unify of this model with kind of the goal of one day having one very general foundation model for, for biology? And the, the first question we, we wanted to, to answer um, to kind of as a first step to enter this subject, in kind of summarizing the title of the slide, like are DNA RMs all you need, was can we use um, language models that have been trained on, on genomics data only to solve a task with, with other modalities. And so what, what we're looking at in this side is can we use this, this for instance, nucleotide transfer models to solve tasks like protein tasks. And actually it's something that's already been looked at in, in a different literature with language models called codon language models. Like for instance, COM, uh, I think has been has been like published recently, which is a very good example where they show that if you actually have access to the uh, CDS of a protein, you can use this information in the language model and actually improve the performance on on some task. However, these models are like trained from scratch on on big data sets of of CDS, and our question was, could we get similar results or maybe even better results, but without having to retrain from scratch, models specifically on CDS, but by using models that have been trained on, on full genomes. And actually, it's it's not that uh, trivial. I would say that it, it will work, because if you look at the training data for models, as it's full genomes, it's it's in the exons, but however, these coding regions only represent 1.5% of the overall data. And also, it's always going to see uh, for eukaryotic species, like intronic regions between the, the sections. So it's never going to see uh, complete through CDS per se. Even though we curated like five data sets on, on five um, kind of standard downstream tasks from the protein literature uh, coming from the ESM papers, and, and we experience like we fine tune the different models. So we fine tune two, two genomics models, like we tried NTV2 and DNA2. And we also fine tune two ESM models on, on this task. For the DNA model, we got access to the to CDS of the sequence. And for the protein model, we got access to the amino acid sequence. And something already interesting is that on two of the out of the five tasks, actually genomics language more like match uh, protein language more. They even actually increase the performance on one task, uh, which is the melting point task. It's also a result that has been obtained in the in the current paper, and I won't go in detail in about 
why we think it's the case in, in this presentation, but we're going to read the paper uh, probably next week. And there is a full analysis of that in the paper. And then something interesting is that on the order task is the opposite. Like the ESM models are completely outperforming uh, DNA language more. And we think that it's because tasks that actually require to capture maybe amino acid variable information or structural information that we know that is being captured by protein language more. So given these results, the, the first question we, we ask ourselves in the direction of building a multimodal model was, as it looks like uh, both types of models, like genomic language models and protein language models have, have different strengths, can we combine them? Can we maybe build one model that's going to guess the, the best of both worlds? So that's what we did with this first a very simple multimodal model where we're going to take a uh, nucleotide transformer and ESM, both pre-trained. We're going to feed the true CDS to the nucleotide transformer and the amino acid sequence to ESM, get two embeddings, concatenate them, feed that to some uh, small neural network and make a prediction. We're going to train uh, this, this network end-to-end -end on, on all these tasks. And what we observe is that we at least always recover the best performance of either like the ESM or, or the nucleotide transfer model, which is already interesting, but we even get positive transfer on one task, which is like protein stability. So for protein stability, we experience that we're not only getting the best performance, which is, I think, ESM for this one, but we actually go beyond and mixing like true CDS information and amino acid information is a way to get like state-of-the-art uh, results. On, on the protein stability. So that motivated us to go to go one step further to see, can we build like a, a general multimodal architecture for not only DNA and protein in this case, but DNA, RNA, and, and protein, and building this architecture in a way that is completely flexible. So you can take your favorite uh, pre-trained DNA model, your favorite pre-trained protein model, same for RNA, combine these models, and kind of get a flexible architecture that you could use for any task, like given any of these modalities as, as inputs. And in this work, we decided to focus on one uh, specific task, which is like um, the prediction of transcript isoform expression. So imagine that most of the people on this call are, are familiar with the informer. So the informer is taking a 200 kbp sequence as input and going to make uh, 30 predictions over 30 tissues of the like, predicted uh, expression of these genes given a uh, rna seq assay however the informer is not at all going to predict like, the expression level for different isoforms it's going to predict like one level for the overall genes but we know that one gene is not going to lead only to one transcript, but different ones. And we also know that the expression level of the isoforms are going to change also between, between tissues. And that explains a, a great part of the biology. And so our idea was here, can we use this multimodal architecture? Can we combine uh, a DNA, an RNA, and a protein model to kind of make um, this prediction, but they are the isoform level? And so here we, we didn't use, for instance, nucleotide transfer as the DNA encoder, but we use informer here. We're going to use um, an encoder for RNA. So we decided to use the, the nucleotide transfer V2, but we could also use other ones. And we use ESM2 for proteins. We re-aggregate these three networks and we make uh, isoform predictions. And that network has been trained on, on all the data we could find on GTEC. And we code the resulting work uh, isoformer and it's going to be released as well on both open source and on bioarchive, uh, probably in, in two to three weeks. And we are pretty happy with the, with the first results. So in this table, I show first the, the preference of the informer on that task. So as, as we could have imagined, that there is a lot of variance between different isoforms. And as informer is not aware of this data, if you just try to fine tune the informer to do isoform uh, expression levels prediction, you're going to use a, a decent but not that high uh, performance. And then we start adding uh, modalities. So the first thing we try was to adjust the, the protein that correspond to the transcripts we want to predict the, the expression from. So in this case, you feed the DNA sequence to the informer, you feed the protein to ESM2, and you're going to make 30 predictions 
one per tissue for the expression of the transcript that would correspond to this protein. We see that by doing this, it already increases the performance. Then we stopped using the protein, but we use the transcript directly instead. And we use nucleotide transfer V2 to, pro to process this transcript. We see that it improves uh, the performance. And interestingly, what we observe is that if you add the three informations, it's where you get uh, the best performance on this task. That was interesting for us because we wouldn't expect that the protein information uh, is actually useful once you have the transcripts. As the data we're predicting is actually um, transcriptomics data. However, we, we and so first, the first assumption I would say is that that could be due to the fact that you're adding more parameters uh, to the system, but it's also um, an assumption that we, we tested and it was not the case. Like if we had parameters in other models, we don't see this increase in performance. And so we think that it may be due to the fact that these different models are capturing maybe different additional features or that the nucleotide transfer maybe wasn't able to capture some features that have been captured by ESM. And one final test we did to kind of validate this size of formula uh, architecture was to see if there is indeed transfer running uh, between the, the different encoders. So we take our multimodal architecture where we have these three different encoders and we take, for instance, the end formula and we replace it uh, by a non-pre-trained model. And so as you can see, you can see the, the performance dropping uh, very significantly. Same for the nucleotide transformer V2. If you replace the, the pre-trained one by the pre-trained, you can see a very clear drop in performance uh, showing that you actually capture um, transfer between these, these different encoders. So do we have any questions that concludes the, the first of these three these three periods, or I can take them at the end. So I move to to a different like uh, would say uh, research direction that that uh, you created. That's one yeah. question. If, or someone. Had... I I cannot see them, so maybe if you um, can just read, yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, hi. Hi. Very nice. So I was just wondering for this uh, GTEx um, example. Are you, how are you quantifying isoforms? Are you using annotated isoforms? Do you use long reads? Uh, or do you use the the, tip, the classical GTEx data set? So that's, that's a very good question. So I'm more like the AI expert of, of the team. I actually have the people from the isoformer with me. Do, do you know? Yeah. Oh, okay. you, you couldn't hear the question. The question is, what is the definition of, of isoform that you use from the GTEx data? The definition of isoform? Yeah. Um, I think that what no what uh good question. So not super. So may, that. maybe maybe if you want, we can take this yeah. one offline after after go. I'd be happy to check and, and answer by email. I, I would sure, say sure. is the is the no standard problem. one Thank in JTEC, you. but I can check. Yeah. Now I was just wondering because basically what would be a very interesting result is whether you took the problem in a very unbiased manner and they checked like the real isoforms kind of that are observed because with short reads you can only guess the isoforms that are or, or ha that have been annotated in ensemble for example yeah. but not uh the full length combinations of exomes that may be observed and that have never been seen yeah that, that, makes that sense. can only yeah. be seen with long reads yeah Thank makes you. sense I, I think in this case is the annotated version that we predict yeah. okay Thanks. So if there are no more questions, I go to this uh, new part of the presentation about evaluation tasks. So if you recall, I presented this 18 task uh, that we used to evaluate our model in the, in the nucleotide transfer paper. And these tasks have been useful because they can be used to kind of test a lot of different design choices and to kind of refine uh, some parameters during training. But kind of we seem it's been something that has been and noticed by many people in, in the community and, and colleagues, and we also completely agree that this task might not be uh, biologically relevant or maybe too simplistic. And so we, we're also trying to find how can we show, how can we demonstrate the power of this nucleotide transform model and how can we tackle tasks that, that are really hard and that really matter to the community. And one, one would say motivation for for this uh, work that I'm going to present was what's happened in, in contemplative vision a few years ago, where for, 
for one computer vision, people like systems who are trying to perform like simple classification or, or regression from images. For example, show an image, they are trying to find if the image is a cat or a dog. And there's been a clear transition in, in the field when people started to move from simple classification to uh, segmentation. Like instead of just attributing a label to an image, can you actually attribute to each pixel in the image a label? Can you like position objects? Can you like kind of really understand uh, the semantics of, of an image? And that's something that evolved quite a lot. So I'm showing here an example for autonomous driving, but there's been like a very also impressive work by uh, Meta called the uh, SAM segment anything model that has been re recently released. And that was one motivation for this work. So the question we asked was, can we do the same actually in genomics? Instead of just training our model to predict if a sequence has corresponds to a promoter or an enhancer, or if there is a splice site somewhere, can we actually do segmentation at the DNA sequence level? And can we predict the, the accurate position of, of elements in the, in the sequence? So to do that, we scraped uh, lots of data from the encode and, and G-code projects. We scraped annotations for 14 different elements uh, over the full um, human reference genome. And we fine tune the nucleotide transformer to predict like for each nucleotide probabilities of belonging to the to these elements. So something different with the previous example I show is that here we're not going to tag uh, one nucleotide to one element, but you can belong, we arrow one nucleotide to belong to different elements. So each of the prediction will be a probability between zero and one to belong to, to one element or not, that we can use this ratio that 0.5. And so one, one nucleotide can be attributed to, to different elements. Like it could be onto an exon, but also to a genic region. And to perform this prediction, we're using uh, a segmentation head. So we're using the unit architecture that's pretty, I would say, common in, in computer vision. And we fine tune this architecture uh, end to end to this prediction. So I'm showing in this example, if you, for instance, take as input a sequence with uh, 30 kilo base pairs, you're going to make a uh, 520,000 predictions in, in one go. And the the first results that, that you observe, for instance, if you look at the left side of, of this plot, was if the first way we first thing we tried was to take uh, baselines. So instead of taking this pre-trained transfer, transformer, can we use uh, convolution neural networks directly on the sequence and make these predictions? And as you can see, we, we pretty far. Uh, from the purple, that is this architecture. We also try to, to take the exact same network at this big transformer and the unit on top, but without retraining of the model by directly fine-tuning on this data. And, and here I would say we are not in a data scarcity uh, problem. There, there is a lot of data available. However, we see at same if we don't pre-train the network, we achieve not, on, not even like half of the performance we can get, reassuring that this first phase where you play this mask language modding task on the data is very important to kind of get the, the features you need to solve the problem. We we then compare this uh, our method to a different baseline. Let's say one interesting way is that if you look at the enhanced tissue specific uh, column was to compare against like this modes that can only uh, classify like a sequence as a as a, an enhancer or not. And we we took this small model and scaled it over the genome and for each region in the genome, we're going to make uh, a prediction of the probability of this region like belonging to the same or not and comparing to sigma NT. And something interesting is that even though these modes are very good at, at predicting just for one small chunk if the chunk belongs to the element or not, when you slide it over the genome, the actual performance uh, decreases quite a lot and shows like the need for models that are going to directly do segmentation at the sequence level. And finally, we also observed that our model is, is very fast. Uh, you can get all these annotations in one go, and it's been completely optimized on JAX. Like you get actually um, all the results in only a few milliseconds on the GPU. We also looked at uh, the context length of, of this model. So if you recall, I mentioned that the nucleotide transformer can go only up to 12 uh, kilo base pairs. So here we're using segment, uh, nucleotide transformer V2 as the backbone of this model. And we wanted to address in this work, can we actually extend this context length afterward? Can we take uh, a nucleotide transfer model that's been trained up to 12 kbp? And can we, can, can we make it work on longer sequences? 
To do that, we use a um, context extension mechanism called Yarn, which kind of is going to add a coefficient to the position or encoding of, of the network. And we show that by using this Yarn technique and fine tuning on bigger sequences, we can actually extend the context. And showed here, like, we trained this segmented model from 3 kbp up to 30 kbp. And we showed like, a steady improvement in terms of performance over all the elements we predict were increasing uh, the sequence length of, of the model. Something also interesting is that we observe zero shot uh, context extension. So we trained up to 30 kbp. And we can actually use the model still up to 50 kbp while increasing the performance of the system. So that also shows that we're not completely limited by the by the training size uh, we use during the pre-training. However, it's it's not going to be a solution to scale uh, up to one million nucleotides, and other architecture is going to be needed. But it was still a good result that that we observed. And here I show an example of what it looks like if you make a prediction on on fifty kbps. So. Actually, it takes more time to, to plot the graph than to make the prediction. So you get these uh, 700,000 numbers uh, in just a few milliseconds. And here we split it, like, them into several graphs uh, just for the sake of, of visibility. But you can you can see like, different elements. So in this case, you can see, for instance, that the network um, has detected like, the, the three different genes. It's also detected the, the promoters, the space sites, purity, uh, et cetera. We, as we can predict spray sites, it's also natural for us to compare against spray sites. So if you recall, I showed like this would say early results of fine tuning uh, the nucleotide transfer on the spray site data set. Here we're using this segment T, so it's a more, I would say, convolved architecture with uh, this um, unit and then also using much more data. And actually we're not surprised to see that the model does very well. Uh, for spacing prediction. So if we look at the test sets from Space AI, we actually match the performance. But if we look at our test uh, data set that include the one from Space AI, but add more sequences. So in our case, we don't only look at can canonical spray sites, but we look at all spray sites. And we also don't only look at positive strands and it's spray side, but we also have spray sites on, on the negative strands. So if we do that, we see that on our test set, we outperform uh, spray side by quite a wide margin. So obviously on the negative strength as per se, I've never seen any negative strengths really. They, they don't achieve any performance, but even on the positive strengths, uh, we actually show improved performance. Something also we wanted to test is that our model also predicts uh, the position of exons and introns. So we also took space AI, took the position of the spray sites and try to see if we can use that with some URC to actually localize the exon and introns and see that if we do that, actually the performance is not at, at all as good as we would expect. And finally, we also looked if we can generalize uh, across species. So yeah, we just look at our model that's been trained only on the human reference genome and use it in, in zero shots on other species. And it was fun to observe that the performance is pretty good on species that are not too far uh, from the human genome and especially we we had the surprise to observe that there are even some species where the performance is better than for humans. So for instance, beaver, I uh, would say it's still an open question why the model is doing better on, on some other species. We think that at this stage, it may be due to the fact that the annotations of other species are maybe not the same quality. And so they only contain elements that, that may be easier to predict uh, than the human annotation that's very, very rich. And a final experiment that we, we did for for this paper was to see, can we add some species to the training to make it better on other species? So we took like other species for which we had annotations. We split them into two sets, like a training species set, testing species set. We added these ones to the training. We kept training, and then we looked at the performance. For the species that were in the training set, we looked at the performance on adult uh, chromosomes. And for the other species, we looked at performance on, on all chromosomes that have not been seen. And what you observe is that if you add a few species to the data set, you obviously become better on, on this species, but you also become better on, on other species. So you can get uh, a transfer, which is also something we observed uh, in the nucleotide transfer training that adding records of different species to a training uh, help to generalize to, to other one. So I would say that was for us a, 
uh, first pre cool results and now we're preparing like the would say next generation but to show that this mode actually can be used to solve like more compact tasks and also to show that the the pre-training phase is really important if you want to get the best performance possible on, on this task so do you have any any question on that on that part otherwise i can can conclude with the final part of the presentation yeah do you want to Yes, uh, I didn't understand yet the, the point with Splice AI on the negative strand. I mean, when you use Splice AI, you, you know, what, what, what's the issue there? So I think the, it's, it's not necessarily an issue. It's just that it's it's never seen any any negative strand, so you need to take the reverse. However, in the in a case, for instance, where you would like look at data that's not annotated or you would kind of design data, you, you wouldn't know by in advance which one it would be. So it was interesting for us to try to see if it would still detect like it on 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 the reverse trend without having to reversing ourselves and to see that it didn't work whereas for segmentity you can put in any any strength is going to detect them. Does that make sense? Not so sure. I mean I would I would run splice AI on either strand and then it will tell me in which direction the, the gene is. And what I understand is you you predict both sides and you need a post processing to know which is the direction of the gene. I'm not so sure. I think space AI, if you if you just take a, a sequence from the negative strands and you run it on it, it's, it's not going to work. Yeah, we can have it, the discussion after. That's yeah. Fine. Okay. Can I ask yeah. a question on the first part? <laughs> Still. Yeah, please. Yeah, so you have these things with the uh, the part instability and to some to some extent also the the gene expression prediction, the isoform prediction. My question is about causality. So are, are these data, um, let's say the part in uh, stability, is it some kind of perturbation data like MPRA data where you have muta mutagenesis down in proteins or is it across proteins? And the question is, are we learning something a bit correlative using other information? Uh, like genes that are highly expressed, yeah. they tend to be highly transcribed, their RNA are stable, and their protein are stable. So it is predictive, but it will not help to design or tell what's the effect of a mutation on, on protein stability. So, okay. Same yeah. applies on the isoform. Yeah, you can improve on isoform because you, are, you, you get a guess from your protein that this is something that is probably also highly expressed on the on the RNA level without being causal. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good question. So in for for this task, uh, I need to check exactly because it depended on on the different tasks. So some of the of these protein tasks are actually on on different proteins from different families. Some tasks are just like a deep screening uh, experiment on on one protein. So for the stability, I don't recall on, on top of my head. It's the is the one that's been used in the in the SM paper. I can revert back after the call and check. Uh, I would guess it's the it's one that has been obtained on one one specific protein with zip screening, but I'm I'm not sure. I need to check for the isoform prediction. I would say so. That there, there are some features that that you're going to capture uh, in the other modalities. It's also I mean adding the other modalities is also a way to kind of tell the system. Uh, for which isoform you actually want to make the prediction. So here, the way we use it is that we're going to fix, for instance, a DNA sequence for one gene, and then we're going to take all the isoforms uh, we know for these genes, and for each of these isoforms, we're going to make a new prediction by putting the isoform into the, the RNA encoder and get like values specific for these isoforms. So we say we expect these different models to capture different features, but we also kind of use that as a as a tag of of the, the isoform we want to predict the expression from. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, there, there I guess there's much less data with mutagenesis screen for isoform prediction anyway. So it's gonna be hard to predict. But yeah, but if you have ideas on on like yeah, better sources for, for data, uh, very happy also to take the conversation after the call. Okay. Thanks. So, up. so yeah, I go to the would say final part of of this presentation. That's something very recent we did, and that we're pretty 
uh, happy about, which is this idea of how can we get transfer learning between the different downstream tasks. So if you look at what I've presented so far, you can pre-train these neural networks and then fine tune them on lots of, of different tasks. However, you're going for each task to, to launch a new, a new fine tuning and to obtain a, a new different model, which means that you're not going to get any transfer. Uh, between between these tasks. However, we think that most of these tasks are, are related, that there are lots of features that can be reused. And we truly believe that if you want to get at some point three foundational models, like models that we really understand biology and genomics from first principles, uh, you need to get transfer between between the, the different downstream tasks. And the the way we wanted to, to tackle this, this question is very similar to what happened in NLP in 2017. So if you look at, at NLP back in the days, actually people were, were not using necessarily next token prediction to, to pre-train networks, but were also using mask language modeling as we do. So they would train these big uh, bad networks. They would take lots of English, mask some words in the, in the sentence, reconstruct them and pre-train very big bad systems. Uh, on other data they can find, and then they would fine tune these models on lots of tasks, like for instance, sentiment analysis. And it worked pretty well, but also people realized that if you wanted to, to get to the next step, if you wanted to have models like ChatGPT, for instance, that can generate lots of new tasks, that can uh, do zero shot prediction, it, it was not going to be enough. And you need to find kind of a general way to get transfer not only during pre-training and fine-tuning but actually during all the tasks that that you can get at at fine-tuning time or the downstream task and this has been first introduced into this uh, t5 paper and then be reused in gpt paper and all the papers that that we know about uh, nowadays in, in nip and the main idea was say can we express can we use english as a medium to express all the tasks so when you want to do sentiment analysis for instance instead of predicting zero or one, like is the sentence uh, positive or, or negative meaning, you would just like ask the question in English, what is the meaning of this sentence and kind of get an answer in English, like this is a positive sentence, this is a negative one, and just keep training as you would do during pre-training, but not on these uh, pairs of, of questions and answers. And the, the question we, we asked in this work that's called uh, chat and T for chat nucleotide transformer was, can we do the same, but uh, in the context of genomics? Okay. Can we, instead of taking the nucleotide transformer and fine tuning it to predict if a sequence is an answer or fine tuning it to predict if a sequence is a promoter, can we actually ask the question in English? Just feed the DNA sequence to the system, ask the question, and kind of train the system to answer directly in English uh, the answer. And by doing that, you can actually use the same objective, which is just simply like a next token prediction. So given the question you want to predict like the, the tokens of, of the answers, you can use the same objective to train the system to do all the tasks uh, that you can imagine at the same time, as long as you are able to kind of show examples of answers and questions uh, for this task. And the arch architecture we're using here has been inspired from what's being done uh, recently in computer vision where people have like bridged the gap also between uh, pre-trained uh, computer vision networks and uh, ARMs, like the networks for English. So typically it could be clip for images and Yama for, for language. And they use a projection to kind of transfer the features from visual space to language space. So it's exactly what we're doing here. So we, we take Yama as a as a large language models, we freeze it. So we're not at, least at all going to update its weight. So we're also going to get the full capabilities of Yama. It can code, it can understand like, different languages, it can answer all types of questions. And what we're going to learn is how to project the embeddings of our nucleotide transformer in the space, in the input space of Yama. So how to transfer like a DNA sequence into an embedding that is in uh, an English space. And then we're going to combine this embedding with the question and, and train the network to output the, the answer. So in that example, if the question would be, is there an, an answer located in that sequence? You would like take this question, embed it in English, take the sequence, put it through the nucleotide transformer, project it, get embeddings into this English space, append them to the embeddings of the question and put that through Lama to get the answer that could be, yes, I was able to find an, an answer in that sequence. And 
we created lots, lots of examples like that on different tasks and, and train this model end to end. One, I would say main, main difficulty here was how to, how to bid actually this, um, this, um, uh, projection function. So there's been two main, two main difficulties here. The first is that DNA sequences can be, can be very long. Uh, they can also have different sizes. Some tasks you're going to have uh, DNA sequences, maybe only 200 base pairs. Some tasks, as for sigma NT, you can have sigma, like, uh, sequences with up to uh, 50,000 base pairs. So the first question we ask ourselves is, how can we make sure that when we're going to compute these embeddings into the English space, is not going to grow, that we are going to have uh, always a fixed number of embeddings. And so to do that, we use an architecture, which is called Perceiver Resampler, that is going to resample like, these embeddings of, of the nucleotide sensor into a fixed number of embeddings. So in this work, we take 64. So whatever is the length of the DNA sequence you're going to put as input, that projection is always going to run like 64 embeddings that correspond to the representation of that sequence in, in English. And that worked pretty well. We trained on neural net on, on solving different tasks, got good results. But when we started to scale the number of tasks, especially when we started to go to 20, 30 tasks, we we show at some point the, the performance completely saturating. And we show kind of almost negative transfer between these different tasks. So here our idea was say, OK, sorry. Yeah. Is anyone asking a question? No. So what we what we tried to do here was say, how oh, can we avoid this negative transfer? And what we observe is that you can actually get uh, an information bottleneck if you are to try to uh, encode any any DNA sequence into this uh, 64 embeddings, because there's probably no way to encode all the biological knowledge you need to solve any type of task. So we can have different processes. Uh, here we do tasks not only for DNA, but also for RNA, for protein. You can have different species. And so there's probably no way to get a one representation with 64 tokens that could extract any of this knowledge. And so what we, what we did here to solve this problem is that we made this projection uh, English aware. So in addition of processing the DNA sequence, you're also going to cross attend to the question. So going to take as input your DNA sequence and the question. So maybe in the question, you see the word and answer, you see a specific tissue, you see a specific species, and you're going to run what are the features you need to extract from the sequence given this answer to produce like a representation of the sequence that can be used then by Emma uh, to solve the task. And we did that on, on lots of different tasks. So I'm showing you a, a, few, a few examples. So you can use that to do like the task from the nucleotide transfer paper. So we can ask questions about promoters and answers, price sites, but you can also even do that for regression tasks. Uh, for instance, here I have the example of the stability uh, task that I showed previously, but in English. So we're going to provide the CDS uh, sequence to the system and ask directly in English, what is the stability? For instance, uh, the scale from minus five to five and train the system to kind of like answer and, and give you the, the value, you can do the same for the degression rate of human RNA and, and so on. Um, the, the first thing we did was to try um, on the 18 task of the nucleotide transfer paper. And interestingly, even if you take the, the same model, so nucleotide transfer V2, uh, here the weights of, of Rama are fixed, so the number of parameters are, are comparable between the two systems, you can see actually that using English as a medium to, to express all the task um, like enables to get transfer. And we actually improve the performance on all these tasks, but not only we improve the performance, but we also achieve that with a single model. So if you look on the right at all these blue points, they all correspond to a single nucleotide transformer that has been fine-tuned for each of the tasks, whereas the chat and T model is being fine-tuned only once on other tasks. And so to move from one task to another, you don't need to change the model, but you can just change the question. And despite doing that, you get actually improved performance, but you also make the model much simpler to use. So in the previous example, you need to change the model. You need to know also what the logits that you return from the model mean, whereas here you can just simply ask the question in English and get a, an answer in English. So you can use the model even if you don't know how to code, for instance. That makes it uh, available to to much more like uh, users. And then we also increase the number of tasks. So we move from this 18 tasks from the nuclear transfer paper to, to more tasks. So we kept some of them, 
uh, we removed some others, we added much more tasks. The idea was to really to try to span different species, different tissues, uh, different like processes, and also to look at tasks both in, uh, in DNA, RNA, and, and protein space. And what we observe is that not only the, the model is conversational, is interactive, but it's also pretty accurate. So here yeah, I'm showing like different examples on protein stability, protein metome, uh, RNA degradation, and can do like both with say classification and regression task uh, with state-of-the-art performance, like despite being uh, a conversational agent. So we are say very excited about this this work and now working on scaling the system and trying to go like from uh, dozens of tasks to hundreds and maybe at some point uh, thousands of tasks to really build like, models that can understand uh, biology from first principles. And that kind of concludes this, this new contribution. So I just wanted to conclude this transform, this presentation to mention, as Roa said, that we're very happy to contribute um, to the open source community and to the research community in general. And like we, we open source all the nucleotide transfer models, the segmenting models. We're also going to open source this isoformer and these different like multi-model models. Uh, we were also pretty happy to see that it looks like these models are, are popular. Uh, last month, I think, yeah, I'm showing on the side 141,000 downloads for one of our nucleotide transformer. I think at some point we even reached uh, 200,000 uh, downloads. And because I got the question, yeah, we checked and it's not our production pipeline that's uh, triggering all these downloads. It's our operation pipeline is using models from, from a different repository. So it's yeah, pretty happy to see that this model have been, have been used quite a lot, actually even more than the ESM models on a ging face uh, last month. And yeah, if you, if you like this research and you would like to, to contribute, uh, we are hiring. So we are hiring in across all the company, different teams, but also in, in our group uh, in Boston and Paris. And I would like also to thank uh, all the people that made it possible. So I, I was not able to include like everybody on, on this side, but I already have a good part of the team. And I obviously also thank all the other like, uh, colleagues in the team, but also colleagues at BioNTech, uh, colleagues at Cornell Tech University and MIT that contributed to some of these works, and also colleagues at NVIDIA uh, that made it possible like the nuclear that transfer thanks to the compute. Right, and it concludes this talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>